was asking me to give permission. Okay, so um, today we have Paula DuPont, who's going to be presenting on a semester of teaching digital media literacy, what worked and what didn't. And Paula is a librarian at Delgado Community College, an instructor at LSU, and she is also our beloved chair of our information literacy, the ILLC. So Paula, are you ready to take it away? Yes, absolutely. Hey there, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So here we go. Hopefully everyone can see that okay. Um, so uh, I'm gonna be talking about a semester of teaching digital media literacy, what worked and what didn't. I'm Paula DuPont. I'm a librarian at Delgado Community College in New Orleans and an adjunct instructor for the School of Library and Information Science at LSU. Um, the eagle-eyed Trekkies among you will have spotted Mr. Spock from Star Trek IV in the background image there which kind of sets the tone for this presentation. It's kind of a dry topic, and I wanted to have fun on our last day of the forum. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Um, today I'm gonna to be talking about the course I teach at LSU, which focuses on critical thinking and digital media literacy. Um, this is Captain Lorca from Star Trek Discovery, inexplicably played by Dra Draco Malfoy's dad. He's asking if you're ready to get going. So I'm gonna to touch very briefly on the need for digital media literacy, because I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, I know that you're all, since we're all interested in information literacy and how we can help our students and patrons, um, you already understand that. Um, then I'm gonna talk about me and my background and um, why I wanted to teach this class and why I think LSU thought I was a good fit. And then I'll talk about what LIS 1000, the course I was, I'm, I was teaching, what it is and why it's being taught talk about the course structure a little bit in the curriculum and then how it went um, and what I think I could do differently to make it work better, especially in an online teaching environment because it is 100% online. So why do students need digital media literacy? So in a 2019 assessment given to 3,446 high school um, students, um, this was done by the Stanford History Education Group, 52% believed that a grainy video showing a 2016 US ballot, uh, US ballot stuffing was real. Um, the video was shot in Russia, so it was not real. 66 couldn't tell the difference between news stories and sponsored content, even when the sponsored content was labeled. Um, so they couldn't tell a news story and an ad. They couldn't tell the difference. And 96% did not consider how ties between the creators of a climate change website and the fossil fuel industry would affect the website's credibility. So um, they didn't think that if, say, Chevron created a climate change website, that Chevron might have um, a, a dog in the game here. So that, those are big issues that we need to address for how um, students and patrons and just citizens are um, consuming media and understanding it. So a little bit about me. Um, why did I want to teach this digital, mid, uh, digital media literacy class and why was I the right person for it? So here's Garrick from Deep Space Nine being my hype man. Um, in October, 2017, I became the OER librarian at Delgado Community College in New Orleans. Um, in part, I'm focused on getting resources online. Um, I was sort of just slotted into the OER position. I didn't even know what OER was when I was hired. But I also sort of carved out an accessibility niche for myself. Um, so a big part of my job is finding online educational resources and then making those resources accessible, um, which means I've sort of got a head start when it comes to online instruction. Just before I started at Delgado in fall 2017, I began teaching a two credit resource research and library skills course at a 100% online university. Um, the majority of my students were PhD candidates and the rest were working on master's theses. Um, so these were research-oriented students who were off in mid-career, and I taught that course for three semesters. And then in spring 2020, I began teaching a new course for LSU School of Library and Information Science, LIS 1000. It was a brand new course. 
So what is LIS-1000? This is another image from Star Trek IV. It's Scotty, who is trying to interact with a 1980s computer by speaking directly to it. Um, he's frustrated. He's addressing it like he might talk to, like we might talk to Google Home or an Amazon device, which I'm, I thought about like pretending to, and I was like, no, I'm going to set off my Google Home and maybe your Google Home. Um, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but wouldn't it be wonderful if we could say, hello, computer, and just get the results immediately, but we have to put in more effort if we want to try to get a reliable answer and we want to get an answer we can trust. So the title of LIS 1000 is Information Literacy and Critical Analysis. And my first lesson for my students was explaining what that title meant because they come in and they don't really know what they're getting into. It's essentially an introduction on how to critically analyze information for research, but also for everyday life. And that's really important because I want my students to be able to take this and not just apply it to searching databases when they're working on a paper, but if they have a question about something that's happening in the news or that they saw on YouTube, I want them to be able to form a question and then use the resources available to them to find an answer. Um, and the fun thing is that it meets half the LSU Gen Ed requirement for analytical reason reasoning, so it counts as a math, um, which I was sort of blown away by, but okay, sure, it's a math. So this is the, the LIS 1000 curriculum and the structure of the course. The first half of the course is devoted to readings and assignments on the seven pillars of information literacy. The second half is media literacy and the students discuss the readings in Moodle forums. Um, the class is 100% online and asynchronous. Asynchronous was a word that I was not familiar with. So it's okay if you are also not familiar with it. It means that we don't have, sometimes a online course, course may be synchronous and they may have online course meetings, like you might have an, a course meeting face-to-face -face. in a classroom, they might have an online classroom and uh, meet online, at, uh, everybody meets at the same time. This was not that. There were no regularly scheduled meetings, they just did all the work on their own time. <clears throat> um, the, there was a mix of the, the short assignments and discussions, like I mentioned, there was a midterm and final, and the students completed a topic proposal, a 20-item annotated bibliography, and a media issue analysis. So here's Spock being fascinated by the media issue analysis. And whether or not you think it is also fascinating, it depends on what the topic was and, and the analysis itself. So the goal of the media issue analysis wasn't to draw a conclusion about the issue, but to demonstrate that the student had examined all sides and viewpoints, which I'll be honest, was a hard for a lot of the students. They really wanted to turn this into an argument paper. They wanted to pick a topic and then tell me what was right or wrong about that topic. They didn't want to, to look at every, every side of it, um, which is really what I wanted them to do. If the student had already had an opinion on the issue, I wanted them to examine their own knowledge and assumptions, what they think they know, as well as other points of view. I didn't want them to just try to support their own previously held opinion with fact-checked resources. Um, and that was, that was something we did bump up against a lot was that the students, they wanted to tell me they were right. Um, but this is an example from um, the, our second textbook. Um, there are four examples of media issue analyses where uh, the author sort of went through a media issue analysis and showed the, the students how it could be done. Uh, so what worked? So the first semester was taught beginning in January 2020, which you may already be getting some ideas about how things began to go wrong later in the semester. Uh, but what worked? Students were excited about the ability to choose any media topic. Um, there's a lot of room to de when deciding what exactly a media topic is. So I encourage students to work on projects of special interest to them. I thought if they were interested in it, if it was something that really spoke to them, they would be more engaged with it. And that was true. They were, they were really engaged with and very passionate about what they were, they were um, researching. Um, asynchronous and online meant the class was popular. Because the class was online and asynchronous and met a basic gen ed requirement, it filled up quickly and had a long wait list. Um, I thought I was only going to be interacting with freshmen, but I got a lot of students nearing graduation who were trying to meet hours or gen ed requirements. Um, it became a class that was really useful for a lot of people that way. It was sort of a broad swath of students, which was, that was really cool. 
Um, also because I'm in New Orleans and work a regular nine to five at Delgado, the asynchronous online format meant that I was able to teach this class at all. If it had met, you know, Tuesdays at um, 3 p.m., I wouldn't have been able to do it. <clears throat> um, our textbooks included incisive assignments that were easily adapted. I mainly adapted the assignments from the textbook and the students had a lot of space to make them their own. One early assignment asked students to identify something in their vicinity they didn't understand and list the questions they would ask to begin researching. Um, that was really just, that was a very early assignment just to get them thinking about um, how to go about the big, very beginning stages of research. It wasn't something that they started researching. One, one person had questions about their ceiling fan and I didn't want them to research the ceiling fan. Just think about what don't you know? You, you might think like, oh, my ceiling fan is always there. I understand my ceiling fan, but you don't. So what don't you know about your ceiling fan? Start questioning things you think you know. Um, so there were a lot of very open-ended assignments that left room for the students to explore information literacy, but also to really apply the, the topics from the readings. Um, so here is a lieutenant from Discovery looking impressed as heck at another example exercise. This is one that I really liked a lot. The students weren't as impressed as I was, but um, I'll read through it very quickly. Accuracy is the reliability, truthfulness, and correctness of the content. Which of the following articles are peer reviewed? How do you know? How did you find out? Were you able to access the articles to examine them? And then there's three articles and then I gave them a little tip and I tried to give them little tips about what exactly I wanted from them in every, um, uh, exercise or assignment. While it probably helps to find the original articles, if you are able to find information about the publications, you may be able to answer the questions with just that. You don't need to read each entire article for the exercise. So I was much more concerned with seeing how the student tried to find the answers than that they got the correct answers. So here it says, how do you know? How did you find out? I wanted to see their research process. I wanted them to show their work. So in some ways, this really was like a math class. Show your work. How did you get to the answer? Um, that's what I wanted to see. Uh, I, wanted them to, I wanted them to really make it clear to me what they were going through. And if they just went through and told, said, this one was, um, was peer-reviewed, this one wasn't peer-reviewed, that wasn't what I wanted from them. So what could have worked better? And here's data looking startled, and sometimes I was startled too. What, what could have gone better? I got lots of great topics for the media analysis, but students were confused by what was meant by media topic. And to be honest, so was I sometimes. I got topics on the death of Kobe Bryant, coronavirus, and this was back in February before we knew what was going to happen, when it was just kind of a thing happening somewhere else. Um, I, sorry, I have a cat appearing. Let me. Okay. <laughs> I got topics on race in the media. And again, this was before we, before June happened, before um, our world sort of exploded. Um, I got whether the news media is dropping the ball by focusing too much on national rather than local news, which I thought was a great topic. Um, the role of media in body image and many, many more. But some students were confused about what would make a good media topic and what was even meant by a media topic. And I could see that, that how that confusion um, was justified and warranted. Um, asynchronous and online meant that I didn't get any face time with students to build relationships and students didn't build relationships with each other. Um, students didn't have that chance to build those relationships. I had students arguing issues from polarized ends of the political spectrum. And I was telling all of them to look at their issues from different angles, but because this was happening in one-on-one -on -one email and not in a classroom discussion, they were all really mad at their mean liberal teacher or their mean conservative teacher. And they missed out on really important discussions with each other uh, because they thought that since I was telling them to look at it from a different point of view, I held that different point of view. And really, I just wanted them to step outside of what they already thought they knew about an issue and examine it from a different point of view to start thinking about um, whether what they thought they knew was really what they knew. Um, for many students, this was their first time doing an annotated bibliography, and students undertook the, co undertook the course without understanding the workload. So um, <clears throat> there was a misunderstanding that because this was an online class, it would be easy and there wouldn't be any papers or real work, and that wasn't the case. I'm not sure any of my students had ever done an annotated bibliography, and that came at them hard. 
Um, it was difficult to bridge the gulf between what they expected when they heard an, a bibliography was assigned and the goal of an annotated bibliography. Um, I created a step-by-step how-to for annotated bibliographies and published it in several places and kept pushing it. But because I wasn't seeing them in person, I didn't see them struggling with the bibliography in the same way. We didn't have that face time with each other for them to seek help organically. And then March slash April lasted 84 years. Here's the Starship Enterprise exploding on her peak because that was March and April for me. Um, somehow that, that March, April period, it lasted forever, but it only lasted like 10 days to it went by in a flash and it went on forever. Um, we lost a week of instruction to COVID-19, but really it was more like three. Um, LIS 1000 was already online, so it wasn't affected, right? No. Um, the university shut down to let, everybody, to let everyone move online and let everyone move off of campus. And I was already online and I was in New Orleans, so I didn't have to move off of campus. But my students had other classes to worry about. And a lot of them were leaving their LSU housing to go back home. So our class shut down with everyone else. But it's not like all of my students were ready to go Monday morning after that week off. People were still shifting. Students had lost books when they moved home. It was a few weeks before we were anything close to settled and things never really calmed down entirely before the semester ended. It just sort of felt like we were running with our pants on fire towards May. Um, so again, like it felt like it shouldn't have been affected, but it, it wasn't. Uh, I was sent home, I was sent home from Delgado to my kitchen table from my, my office at Delgado and my library at Delgado to my own home when New Orleans shut down. I used to get a lot done in my lunch hour at work, but now I had a two-year-old hanging off of me most of the day. Um, my students had it just as bad and worse. I had students who lost their childcare, students who had parents who got sick, students who lost all privacy and were now trying to complete their coursework at a busy family dinner table, just like I was. Um, there were students who just didn't come back to class, students I just didn't hear from anymore. Um, I stopped counting things as late. I just wanted my students to turn things in whenever they could. As so many of, of you know and understand firsthand, it was a rough time for students. It was a rough time for us all, but it was a rough time for, for students who had those deadlines to meet. So that was a bummer. How will fall 2020 be different and how can we help our students succeed? Here's the Starship Enterprise warping off into a hopefully bright future. Um, first, COVID-19 is our new reality. So many of us don't know how fall will look or if November will look anything like August. What we think, um, you know, August 1st is going to be like may change, you know, in the next couple of days. And what we think um, August, you know, August 1st may look very different from the end of August and August may look very different from November. So we just have to be prepared for change. It's, that's going to be our new reality. Um, at Delgado, our faculty have been talking about resilience a lot. A member of faculty said we would have been better prepared for COVID-19 if we were living the lessons of Hurricane Katrina. Um, we need to be resilient. We need to be prepared for the unexpected. What our students or patrons are facing may change, and we need to prepare ahead of time to meet those changes with them. And that means being kind with yourself and your students and patrons. Being resilient means you can bounce back, but it also means you have to be able to bend so that you don't break and your students and your patrons are gonna, you have to allow them to bend so that they don't break. So what else am I gonna do that's more concrete than that? I feel like this is something the K through 12 teachers are already way ahead on, but I'm going to insert more opportunities for face-to-face -face interactions because the context of my class um, doesn't allow for scheduled mandatory class meetings. I'm just going to have to create a lot more opportunities for optional weekly conferences. These are going to be featured on the week's page so the students don't have to go searching for them. If a student wants to get in touch, I don't want them to have to go digging for my email address. I want to make it as easy as walking up to my office. It's going to be my virtual office. It's going to be right there for them because I want to be face to face with them as much as possible. Um, I'm going to create increased opportunities for student discussions. I had created a couple of forums for students to interact outside of the mandatory graded forums, but these weren't well used last semester. I really want to foster spaces for students to interact and look to each other as peer resources, especially as these peer interactions are going to be greatly reduced or even eliminated for a lot of students. Even as schools return to in-person instruction, 
a lot of courses will remain online or have significant online components and limited classroom instruction. I think it's important that we are proactive in giving students forms to interact with one another as colleagues. Um, and then more specifically to me, I'm gonna do an in-depth syllabus review video in Moodle page. I found when we got to the end of the course, students were shocked that they had to complete the media, media issue analysis. I think part of this was also that this happened after quarantine began. And it was part of just, it was like their memory reset. Um, so, but it was the, basically the culminating exercise of everything we had done. The topic proposal led to the, the annotated bibliography, led to the media issue analysis. So in an online environment, students get to choose what parts of the course they interact with. And if they skip my syllabus, syllabus review at the beginning of the semester and my explanation of the assignments, the end of the semester hit them hard. Um, my solution this semester is just going to be to put more touch points throughout the course so that they, they if they're missing that, they're, it's going to be harder for them to miss it. It's going to be a more concerted effort on their part to miss it. Um, and finally, a greater focus on assignments that students struggled with. Um, again, this is specifically to me, but I saw the assignments that students struggled with, so I can try to focus on how to make those assignments better accomplish our learning goals. More broadly, though, I know students who went from face-to-face -to, -face to online environments struggle in new and different ways. Online hits different. There will be students taking online classes this semester who normally stick to in-person. I was a student who, until I went to LSU to get my MLIS, which was 100% online by that time, I never took online classes because I was terrible at it. I just didn't, I, I knew that if I took an online class, I was gonna fail that class. So I stuck to in person. So there will be students this semester who they're, they know that they will succeed in an in-person class and they tend to do badly in online classes, but they don't really have that choice anymore. And they're gonna be taking some online classes. So we need to make sure we're looking out for those students. We have to be really responsive in adjusting our expectations for each assignment and making sure our students are coming along with this. And then finally, I am your friend. I have been and shall always shall be your friend. Here is my contact information. Um, please feel free to reach out to me. These slides will be made available and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of the session. Thank you so much, Paula. That was so interesting. I want to take your class now. <laughs> um, so as Paula said, we're going to save our questions until the Q&A at the end. Um, so next up, we have Rob Stevens, who is going to be presenting Preventing Failure to Launch, How I Teach Research as Inquiry Using a Paperclip. And Rob is a research and instruction librarian and coordinator at Nichols State University. Rob, are you ready to take us away? I am. Thank you so much. Right. I'm going to share my screen here. One moment. Okay. Thank you guys for coming today. I'm Rob Stevens, and that is a gif of me having paper gifts paper clips thrown in my face. I just thought it was funny to include something like this when, um, and also funny to get my coworker Brandy to, um, <laughs> to throw paper clips at me. I'm going to be talking about uh, how I use a specific exercise and modeling the exercise for you in this Zoom call. Now I should warn you that I haven't done this over Zoom. I was typically do this um, in person, but I think it will work. And I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about my background. So this is how I came about this exercise. Um, previous to working as a librarian at Nichols, I was a creative writing and first year composition professor. I taught first year composition at um, two other universities before I came to Nichols and also creative writing. And I, Notice that that's, this is going to be my little avatar here, and notice I'm ho holding a flask, which is not something I ever did, but that was the avatar that looked the most like me. Um, I observed a really common problem when I was assigning research-based writing problems, and this is actually a really great transition from what Paul was talking about, because I think it's a, a related topic to what Paul was talking about. So that was one thing that happened to me, was that I observed this. The other was that I saw Bruce Ball Ballinger speak. Um, he's the author of A Curious Researcher, which if you don't know, is a very common text to assign in first year composition. 
Um, I was a graduate student at Florida State and he came and spoke to us and he gave this exercise, actually reached out to him and told him I was using it for this presentation. Um, and he was really excited about that. So that was super cool. And so here's the problem that I was experiencing when I was assigning a topic. And this, remember, is me teaching um, me in the role as a professor. Um, I would often assign a research topic and say, you should choose your own topic. And then the students will say, would say something like, we will all write about gun control um, or some other huge issue, some controversial issue like that. And then I would say, no, 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 write about something you're interested in. And then they would say something like, okay, then we'll write about abortion, you know? Um, and what I found that was when they started writing about these huge topics, there was, it was really hard for them to get their paper off the ground. Um, how do you write a five to 10 page paper about gun control or abortion or, you know, even something like doping in sports was a really common um, paper topic. It's, it's impossible because you haven't narrowed the topic properly. And um, at the end of this, you know, by the end of the paper, I've often felt like me and the students would be like, you know, I would watch their papers crash and burn. Um, and this isn't true of all students, I should say. I don't, I don't want to say it's true of all students. I just thought it was a persistent problem um, and a problem that was weird because it wasn't like necessarily the students who were typically the, you know, lower performing students who would have this problem. Sometimes it was the higher performing students um, and sometimes it was lower performing students. It really, there was no correlation um, to what students were having this trouble. What I found was that there was a disconnect in how I perceived topic solution versus how the students did. The students thought, I want to pick a huge topic. I want to find as much research as I can. I've never written a five to 10 page paper in my whole life. How could I hit five to 10 page paper without picking something like gun control where I can you know, find an infinite number of topics on? They also thought, oh, I have to write an argument. So I'm going to find a controversial topic. And I can just pick a side, the side that I probably already agree with. Paula talked about this a little bit, right? And just sort of um, back that side up, back the way that I feel. And often the way that they feel, um, you know, if you can harken back to when you were a freshman in college, was just the way that they were raised, right? So they're not really even thinking critically if they're doing this. Um, they often thought that the goal of the research paper wasn't really even to make an argument. It's just to pick a side and present that side, which is a lot different than sort of stepping into a scholarly argument. And they thought that they would impress me by picking a, a you know, a controversial topic in the news um, and, and often I had a similar thing to, you know, I keep talking about Paula's presentation, I thought it was great, but had a similar thing to where it's like, oh, they think I'm a conservative or liberal professor, you know, so they're trying to write about a topic to impress me. Um, or they think that they're going to prove that they're somehow, you know, really smart by writing about, um, you know, abortion or one of these topics. Um, on the other hand, what I thought was a good topic was a narrow topic, an appropriate amount of research. The paper is only five to 10 pages, right? You could write books and books and books on gun control. Um, I thought that they wanted to find a niche, uh, write something new, find something that hasn't been said, something new to them. I wanted them to investigate what others were saying about the topic and enter into a conversation about it. Um, and I wanted to, them to impress me by writing a topic they were passionate about. The best topics, um, I don't remember any of those huge controversial topics, but I remember the kid that wrote about yo-yo competitions, you know, like that's the topics that were you know, the students were truly passionate about, but they didn't have the, it was almost like they had a camera, but didn't know where to point it. And then I transformed into a librarian. I started working at Nichols in January. And as I was working and sort of, you know, I got my MLS a couple years back, right around the time that the frameworks were coming out, Framework for Information Literacy from the ACRL. Um, and I started doing a lot of research and reading about the frameworks and got really into this idea of research as inquiry and kind of connected this exercise I'm going to do with you guys to the research as inquiry. Um, what I had found and experienced myself as a professor and have read a lot of literature on is that, you know, a lot of times professors, when they ask you to do one shot instruction or instruction in general, they want you to sort of come in and do a skills based class. And this really harkens back to the standards, right? They want you to come in, show people how to retrieve information, um, show people how to use your databases, show them how to do a research consultation, how to meet with you. Um, but I would really wanted to broaden that. And I wanted to come up with an exercise that was short that I could both show those skills, but also maybe give this exercise if it was the right time in class. Um, and I was keeping those, the, the framework of research as inquiry in mind, um, cause I feel like this most closely, um, sort of helps students understand that. 
as a refresher as to the framework of research as inquiry, um, each of the frameworks has knowledge practices, so things that students and learners and um, researchers will practice when they are practicing this framework, and they have dispositions. And I'm just going to kind of go over the relevant ones that I think that this exercise hits on. So learners who are developing their information literate abilities, they formulate questions for research based on information gaps or re-examining of existing possibly conflicting information. Um, Number two here, I think, is super important. They determine an appropriate scope of investigation. Remember, I talked about how students were writing about these huge topics and thought they had to write about huge topics. They deal with complex research by breaking complex questions into simple ones. And you'll see how that's going to tie in. We're going to take, uh, we're going to ask really simple questions in a minute. And they use various research methods based on need, circumstance, and type of inquiry. As far as their dispositions, um, they think of research as open-ended exploration. So um, students don't think, okay, I believe this, you know, learners who practice this disposition, I should say, aren't gonna think, okay, I believe this, I'm gonna go, quote, prove it by using other people's information. They think, I'm curious, I want to learn, right? I, this is, it. I'm exploring a topic. They appreciate that a question may appear to be simple, but still disruptive to their research. So they're willing to change the course of their research while having it. Value intellectual curiosity, I just kind of said that. They keep an open mind and critical stance. And they value persistence, adaptability, and flexibility, and recognize that ambiguity can benefit the research process. And one thing I can say is that when students feel as though they're in a moment of ambiguity, it can be very frustrating for them. So it's time to do an activity. And for this activity, I'm going to ask you guys that if you have a paper clip nearby, um, I want you to take that paper clip out. Um, you don't need to show it to me or anything. I just want you to have it in your hands for this activity. And we are going to generate questions, research questions, about a paperclip. Um, we're going to do this as a group, and this is how it's going to work. So once you have your paper clips in your hand, I am going to share something different. I'm going to share a whiteboard here. And I'm going to be typing your answers in this whiteboard. Um, and I'm gonna have, I have the chat up right now, but this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna ask you guys to ask a question in the chat about either the paper clip that you're holding in your hand or paper clips in general. I would like for the question that you ask about paper clips to be one that is something you could look up, um, something you could research potentially, um, not a, not something that's observable. So, for example, you wouldn't want to ask what color is the paperclip in my hand. You could say, oh, that's a pink paperclip. Um, I'm going to pull a paperclip out for you guys, actually. Um, but rather, something about the paperclip. And, and it can be anything. I don't want you to limit it. And I want you to try to ask different questions. Um, I am asking Celine. Oh, this is good. We'll just go. We'll just go. So somebody asked, who designed it? Um, who invented it, what material is made. This is great. How many colors does it come in? Why are there different sizes and colors? Who manufactures them? And forgive me if I make spelling errors here. Um, was the paper clip industry affected during World War II. Uh, what crafts are made from paper clips? What is the patent on paper clips? Um, are paper clip injuries common? Good. Let's see what else we've got here. I might have passed. Oh, where does the, uh, where does the metal come from? Have there been changes in the industry since digital? Oh, I love this question. When you unfold them, why can't you get them back to the original shape? That's a great question.
All right, and if you've asked a question already, I'm gonna ask you to ask another question now. Um, and try to ask one that's different than what we've got here. Keep this rolling. Um, I would love to, good, production of paper clips. How many paper clips are produced annually a day? Um, what are the other uses? What is the average, I love this, what is the average amount of paper that a paper clip can hold? What sizes do they come in? You know, what is the standard size? What is the biggest or smallest paper clip? Uh, yeah, recycling is a really good issue. Um, can paper clips be recycled? Um, is there a factory you can visit? Oh, I'm so Jason. I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, Angie asks, who is the leading paperclip manufacturer? And uh, I'm just going to, um, Jason, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, uh, sort of abridge your, your, your question here, but what's the deal with Clippy, which was what that paper clip's name was? Yeah, that's, a, it's a super great question. Um, all right, and we, <laughs> I think we all miss Clippy and we all don't miss Clippy at the same time. This is a lot of questions. Um, this is an exercise to do with my students. And now, if you were uh, a researcher, and, and one of the things I do is, um, I will often at the end, just to prove, there we haven't even hardly touched paper clips and the sort of totality of it, right? Um, we could ask things, all sorts of questions about, uh, you know, nobody asked, about the cost to make them to sell. Um, I like to think a lot about how many paper clips just get lost. How many get lost without using them? Um, I like to think a lot about the environmental impacts, what paper clips are made of. You know, is the what's the future of the paper clip? which somebody sort of asked about di digital. Um, the history of the design. Um, how many paper clips are in the world? I often wonder, could you uh, count paper clips per capita? You know, would that would uh, the number of paper clips in a com in a country um, say something about that country's productivity or wastefulness? Um, and now you see we've got a ton of uh, a ton of questions about a topic that to students um, and maybe even to you uh, we take for granted every day, right? We interact with these things all the time, and we never ask questions about them. And and here what we've done is we've we've sort of started the process of asking interesting questions and small questions that could lead to a research paper. And I'm gonna ask you guys, and you can just type in the chat or if you wanna hop in and, um, if you wanna hop in and just say something, that's fine. Uh, which of these, how would you develop a, and look, you guys are librarians, I understand with students this is, this is different, but how would you develop a paper out of one of these topics? How would you research something? Um, which of these would you pick and why? Uh, I'd love to hear from somebody. If you were, if I told you, you have to write a, a research paper on paper clips, which of these would you pick? Why would you pick it? And how would you go about it? I hear someone, sort of. Hi, this is Celine. I think I would probably start with the history of how paper clips came to be. Yep. And um, how would you research that, Celine? I would probably use um, encyclopedias um, and then uh, maybe journal articles to find out 
if other people have researched this already? Yeah, good, good. Um, good. I would, somebody asked, um, yeah, let's get somebody else. What would, what would be another question that you guys would um, research here? And how would you research? Oh. Paula says, I would start with what the metal is made of. Is there environmental impacts for the mining metal or the production, right? And, and you can see that from both of these starting points, um, we are starting, we could start to develop an argument about paper clips. Um, so Paula, in the case of your paper, we could go look up what the metal is made of, right? That's not a question that anybody asks, but you know, I assume it's some sort of aluminum. We could ask what's, what's the metal made of, and then we could go and look that up. And then we could look at the environmental impacts of it. We could find out how wasteful, how many of these do just sit in drawers? How many of these do we actually need? How many of them get thrown away? Um, these are things that would be, it might be tough, but you could do surveys to find out how many paper clips people have versus how many they use. You could look up the metal, right? You could look up the environmental impacts, whether it's recyclable. Uh, you could look up how many paper clips are made in a year. And now we're starting to develop a, a really interesting um, argument about the sort of environmental impact of something as simple as a paper clip. Um, regarding what Celine said for her um, looking into the history, there's a lot of different ways you could do that, right? You could start by looking at the patent, um, which if you, when you look at least in our EDS, uh, in our EBSCO, the patent comes up in there. You can look at the patent, you could look at the history of the design of the paperclip and why the paperclip is what it is today. Um, why is this the standard paperclip? Um, and why do we not use these as much, for example? You know, um, this is, if I, I had a student write a paper on why we use these versus these, uh, I would be so much more interested in that paper then whether or not my student you know believes we should have or shouldn't have guns and why they believe that um this is a really interesting path and, and this clears up a lot of um sort of myths about what the research process looks like um, jason says i'm curious if other office projects have been made in animated characters and what their lifespan was like right so jason i love that you took this a totally different way right you went Okay, so we have Clippy, the paperclip. Um, he became this animated thing, and and we sort of have these good memories of him at the time. But Microsoft actually killed him off. Um, killed him off. Got rid of him because people thought he was annoying at the time. That's why they they got rid of him. So I'm going to go back to my my presentation here. Thank you guys for asking questions and participating. And I'm going to talk about how I do this in class. And I know that there is a ton of text on this, and I normally on a, on a PowerPoint slide would not put all this text, but this is the instructions for this exercise, which Bruce Ballinger, who made it up, calls the myth of the boring topic. Um, I call it past the paperclip. I wanted to have all these instructions on there, so if you wanted to either screenshot or if you come back to the recording, you can have this. And I'm gonna go through how this works in a classroom. So what I do is, um, there's a physicality to this exercise that I think is really good when you're in a physical classroom. I hand a paperclip to a student. Um, it doesn't have to be a paperclip. It could be a common object like a pen or a staple, a stapler. I find that the less, sort of the more nondescript the object is, like a paperclip, the more general it is, uh, the more interesting the object, the exercise goes. So informed students, they will each be asking a question about either the object the person is holding, so the paper clip in their hand, or that object in general, paper clips in general, right? Tell them the question shouldn't be something they can easily observe or something that is impossible to find out. The questions must be something they'd have to investigate, but could figure out. So occasionally I have students ask something really obvious, like what color is it, right? And it's silver. And sometimes I'll ask, they'll, they'll ask these really theoretical questions like, um, you know, if you launched a paper clip with a piece of cheese staple to it, you know, into space, what would happen? Th those aren't useful for a research paper. So those are the two questions I try to get them to not do. Students pass the item around the room. So today I had you sort of just type in your questions and that worked great. If I were in a physical classroom, I would pass this paper clip to each student. And there's something really powerful about holding the object in your hand. That's why I asked you guys to get one out and looking at it, right? Looking at the shape and the design and thinking about it. The person holding the paper clip asks the questions. You don't want to let students ask the same question or questions that are too similar. Uh, you want to urge them to ask new questions. I do, help, however, help students out if they get too stuck or have their peers help them out. So I'll say things like, okay, we haven't considered the environmental aspect of paper clips. We haven't considered 
the shape or size of paper clips. We haven't considered the design. We haven't considered the cost of paper clips. I often like to go around the room and have everyone hold the paper clip, then go back around. And I don't warn them until we go that we're going back around. They think this is cruel because um, the person who went first often thinks, oh, this is great. I went first. I got to ask the easy question. And then they realize, oh, I have to ask the last question too. It really pushes students that, that I trust that they can come up with more questions. Um, occasionally, there will be a little pushback from students who really just don't want to participate. But the nice thing about this is that a lot of time I find their peers get really interested and start thinking of all these questions they could ask about paper clips and will help them. I always write the question in a place where students can see. And then ask, after students ask the questions, I ask them the following. How would you research these questions? And ask them to point to specific ones. What are some of the issues raised by these questions? Which of these would lead to a good research question? How would you develop a paper out of these questions? A little pro tip, it's fun to have some of the answers to the questions ahead of time. For example, someone always asks, in a, especially in a class of students, if people ever die due to paper clips or use them as weapons, um, the answer is yes. I like to show them that after for fun. They always get a kick out of this. Um, this guy on the left um, died because they had fixed a tripwire with paper clips rather than fixing it correctly, and he hit the tripwire, and then a polar, no, and he, uh, the tripwire didn't work, so a polar bear mauled him. Um, and this one happened in 2020. 23 year old man went through a hospital using a paperclip as a weapon um, and he got a prison sentence for it. Um, so the answer is yes, I like to have those ready to go so that students, you know, they think it's fun when you're like, actually, they are used as weapons and they do kill people, um, or at least there's paperclip related deaths. Now, why does this activity work? And there's Clippy, your guy. I wanted to bring him on. I knew somebody here would ask about Clippy. Warning, if you talk about Clippy or the paperclip from Microsoft Word to students who are 18 to 22, they won't know what you're talking about and they will think you're you know, just making something up. Um, but that is Clippy and for a short brief thing on him, you know, he's part of the Microsoft Word experience. People thought he was annoying. Uh, they got rid of him. People got sad that he was gone. They tried to bring him back. People got annoyed with him again, so they got rid of him again. That's what happened to Clippy. That's the short story. You can, if you Google just like Clippy the paperclip, he comes up. This is why the activity works. I love this activity because it's challenging, but it's not too challenging. It's challenging for students. It's probably easier for people who have the skills to think of these questions, but for freshman students, they find it challenging to think, how can I ask a question about a paper clip? Um, but it's something that I find that they all can do. And once they get the hang of how to think, you know, about the paper clip and think about different aspects of it, they really start to like catch fire with it. Uh, it shows students that they can make a topic out of something small. It teaches them scope, right? Um, that I would much rather have them write about a paper clip or write about something small like that, something they're interested in, than think that they have to write about, you know, a huge topic in politics. It demonstrates how research isn't just finding, quote, the right quotes from journals or Google. That research also can mean like, Going to the store and buying a, a box of paper clips or looking at a box of paper clips and seeing how many they there are in there. It can mean contacting a manufacturer of paper clips. Um, and yes, I do often use the paper clip then when I move on to teaching those hands on skills. Um, I'll use the paper clip as my example to search for when I'm teaching them how to use the discovery search or EBSCO or database uh, so that it's like, look, there are there's tons of research out there about paper clips. And even within the topic of paper clips, you really need to narrow it down. I often have students cite this exercise as fun and as one of their favorite things and something that opened their eyes when they give the, our evaluations of the class. And it's a really nice way to incorporate the frames in a short amount of time before you move on to showing databases. Now, of course, before you do this exercise, you're gonna wanna get in touch with the professor and make sure that they're, usually this works best when they're in the topic selection, topic selection part of the class. Um, if they're asking you to come in after topic selection, um, this works a little less well because they already have a topic in mind. But I have used it often. What I do is I transition from this to I say, now I want you to ask you know, 25 questions about your topic. Um, because a lot of times they haven't even taken the time to ask questions about the topic. They go sort of um, in my experience, I've watched them go to a database and just type in, you know, I know I keep using this as an example, but just type in gun control. 
and just see what comes up. Um, and look, that's not a bad strategy necessarily, but it is a very, very early on strategy that you might want to be using. Um, and I want them, I would rather them be asking these questions first in order to help them. Another thing that I will do with this exercise is I will use this to develop keywords for them, right? And show them how to use keywords. So if you're doing environmental um, aspects of paper clips, you might think of the types of metal they use. You might think of different words for environmentalism, recycling, um, and then I'll have them type those keywords into the class. And you have to tailor this to where the class is with the research, what the teacher is asking you to do, the professor is asking you to do when you come into the class. This, to end with, is a image of a paperclip being made, um, which I find absolutely fascinating. Um, my fascination with paperclips, since I've started doing this exercise, has 100% grown. Um, I am sort of obsessed with this topic of paperclips, um, and it is in my plans to write my own paper on paperclips since I've been do doing this topic. Um, but you can see that, uh, I don't know, I think this, this GIF sort of embodies the um, beauty of, of the paperclip making process. Um, please do get in touch if you have questions about this exercise. My email is rob.stevens at nichols.edu. And I appreciate you guys going to bat and asking a bunch of paper, uh, questions about paperclips. And I hope that you consider using this exercise in your classes. Thank you so much, Rob. That was amazing. And I am never gonna look at a paperclip again the same way. Um, and I think this afternoon I may be um, researching paper clips to answer some of those other questions for myself, um, which I'm now wondering. Um, so now we're going to shift to the Q&A section of this session, and um, we're going to see what questions we've gotten in the chat box. So Elizabeth, I think I saw some questions coming in. Yep. Um, I have, the first one is for Paula. And so... They asked, I have students who struggle with the annotated bib two. Are there alternative or complementary assignments you consider? Okay, so what I do is um, it's not, oh wait, I still have, I have, give me a second. I gotta fix something real quick. Cause I'm also the host guys, so. I had Rob spotlighted while he was doing his presentation. So I needed to unspotlight him, okay. Um, so, uh, when I am, um, doing the annotated bibliography, I don't really have a, uh, a, an assignment or any, like something like that that I do with them. But, um, what I do is I have them think about it like this. I tell them that for our purposes. There are some times when you need to do an annotated bibliography where you need more than this, but for our purposes, I only need two to three sentences um, for each uh, citation. So I tell them I want them to answer three questions. I want them to answer who, what, and why. So I want them to answer um, who, is, who wrote the resource, who created the resource, um, and tell me their credentials. So tell me who's, like their names, and why, like, why I should care about what they're saying. So um, this is so-and-so who um, has a PhD in such and such and is a lecturer on this, that, and the other at this university. Just tell me who the person is. And tell me what the resource is. Um, this is a journal article in blah, blah, blah that talks about this topic or this is a news article at the New York Times that explains, you know, recent research into such and such. Just tell me what it is, what it's about. And then why, why is, why is this important to your research? Why are you using this article rather than something else? Whatever your topic is, there's lots and lots of material about it. Like as Rob was talking about, there's so much material out there. Uh, you're doing 20, resources for me. Why did you choose this one and not one of the other hundreds? So how does this relate back to your research? Why are you including this article instead of one of the other hundreds of articles? So who, what, and why? And those are the three questions that I want them to be thinking about as they're um, writing their annotation for their citation. So that's it. That's what I do. Awesome. So are there any other questions?
I don't see <clears throat> any more in the chat. Does anybody want to um, just chime in and ask the question? I got one from Celine, it looks like. Um, oh. said, do you want to read it a little yeah. bit? Sure. Um, it says, uh, Rob, I love the exercise. And I think it is something that I can do with my elementary students to introduce research to them. I am curious, after doing the paperclip exercise with your students, what are some of the most interesting topics that students have been chosen to write about? Yeah, that's a great question. I would love to see how this would work with elementary students, Selena. I haven't worked a ton with elementary students. Um, as far as great topics that they've chosen to write about, it's always when they pick something uh, really interesting to themselves so, um, that and, and, and something that is like, um, not expected it, when I get a topic that I haven't heard. So I talked about a student in my class who talked about uh, like yo-yo competitions and the competitive yo-yo scene. It was like a super interesting paper. Um, I've had a couple, I've had like a couple students who have done deep dives into um, aspects of like a video game that they played. Um, so they might do like a feminist or environmental reading of a video game that they've played. Um, I always encourage them to start by looking at their hobbies and seeing if there's something within their hobbies that they might want to write about or research about. So, you know, if I were doing a research paper and I were in a first year class, if I were a student, you know, right now I would be really interested in researching, like I'm really into the, the and I actually wrote a paper about this before, but I'm really into Pokemon, the trading card game. Um, I would so much rather them write about that than write about, um, you know, some major issue that they think they have to step into um, and why it's bad or good, you know, I'd rather them do that. Whenever they're willing to track the history of a physical object, that's always something that's really interesting. Um, and whenever they're willing to like follow a community, um, those are two of the things I often try to get my students to do. Like, can you look deeply into a community and, and show us what it's like inside that community? Um, or can you look at the history of this object and talk about the design of the object? All right, are there any more questions for Rob or Paula? And you can just chime in and chat or you can um, turn on your mic if you want. All right, so um, thank you so much, Paula. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, this was awesome. Um, another awesome day of the forum. Um, and so that's all that we're gonna have time for today. I wanna thank everybody for coming. Um, we hope that you enjoyed our ninth annual NOLA ILC forum and um, we'll of course be back next year and maybe um, because we've had so much fun doing this digitally, we might have some little things thrown in throughout the year. We'll see. Um, so just to remind you, um, we've got uh, a URL to our networking sign-up spreadsheet. Um, we're going to post that in the chat box again. Um, for anybody looking to collaborate with others on something from today that you heard today or something else that's just in that networking sheet. Um, we're also going to post in the chat box um, an evaluation form to get feedback on the today's presentations. Um, and finally, if you'd like to rewatch or share today's presentations, um, we have recorded those and we're going to be posting those recordings um, to our YouTube channel and we'll be sending that URL out to our channel very soon. Um, so take care, everyone. Um, stay healthy and safe. And thank you so much for joining us for the NOLA ILC forum. Thanks.